Okay then, so to finish up with Borkin out, I don't want to read the entire rest of the essay because I don't want to tarry too long here and get us lost uh, off track from where we were with Spengler. We were still only 10 pages into the introduction, so we have a lot more to go. Um, but what I, I would like to talk about in this video is the cosmology of Plotinus uh, on the one hand, because uh, Borkenau says that um, his next section is on Christianity. C Christianity and the rise of a new death transcendence. So Christianity now goes back to the death transcendence of the river valley civilizations, especially Egypt, Mesopotamia and Egypt, which were both death transcending as we have seen. And Christianity goes back to that as though Hellenism were just a mere interlude, interlude between them. And indeed, a great deal of Christian theology was worked out in Egypt, in Alexandria. The Father, Son, Holy Ghost thing, as we'll see here in a, in a second, is a transformation of the god Ray and uh, uh, Osiris and Horus. Um, they are equivalent to Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. That trinity, and Egyptian mythology is full of trinities anyway, like the Heliopolitan trinity was Atum, Shu, and Tefnut. Um, so the, the main trinity of Ray, Osir uh, Ray Osiris, and Horus. Uh, Horus is the, the, the spirit, the Holy Spirit. Osiris is the dead one like Christ who rises and falls. And Ray, of course, is the sun god, the one, the eternal. Uh, so there are a lot of correspondences and morphological analogies between Christian theology and Egyptian theology. Um, so he says, I just want to read these first two paragraphs, uh, and then we'll, we'll, we'll take a pass on the rest of Borkenau, um, where he says, What appears striking about the rise of Christianity is the transition from death acceptance to a new phase of death transcendence without the intermediary of a fully developed dark age. This is a good point. Um, Christianity comes in, um, and it's not preceded by a dark age. The only problem with that is that he misses the point that Christianity is already part of a culture that has had a dark age and is already up and running, namely the Magian. It comes out of the Hebrew, um, which is the pre-culture phase, of the Magian Arabian civilization, which has already had its dark age, as we have seen with the Exodus and the Sea Peoples, uh, 1200 BC. So he's kind of missing that point that Christianity is a, is a transformation of the Magian that comes in uh, about midway through that culture. Um, uh, this is at any this at any rate seems uh, true of the Eastern Mediterranean, where the fundamental transition uh, occurred, but a full blown collapse did take place at the western and northern end of the geographical area in question. Both circumstances must be considered separately. If the phenomenon we have called a dark age arises from the collapse of a death transcending culture into death denying and paranoiac barbarism, it would seem logical that the reverse process gives rise to a different conclusion. Loss of faith in survival leaves a void which must be filled. On the contrary, where such a faith asserts itself, there is no void, and no room seems left for a paranoiac retrogression. Yet the emergence of a genuine dark age in the Roman world, similar to that of the 2nd millennium BC, suggests that our form formula is still inadequate. It would appear that typically two distinct forces are at work, loss of faith on the one hand, and a barbarian invasion of the highest culture on the other. There is no need to labor the point that such an invasion occurred, both in the case of the pre-Hellenic world of the 2nd millennium BC and in that of the Roman world in the first centuries of our era. So he's talking about two different things there, the, uh, the Dark Age that attends the collapse of the Roman Empire, which once again is a, is a true, authentic Dark Age, a disruption, not an ossification, a disruption uh, just like uh, the disruption, let's say, of the Byzantine civilization, which was cut off uh, by the Ottomans who invaded it and ch chopped it up and swallowed it, um, or the disruption of the West uh, disrupting the Aztec world and just chopping that head right off. Um, so certain societies die by ossification, uh, as ours seems to be doing right now, and others by barbarian invasions, which cause an immediate disruption. Um, but now I, I want to emphasize this point about where he says Christianity now is a return to the death transcending cultures of the Middle East. After this he has another chapter, a brief one, where he talks about how the Renaissance as it comes along and tries to revive the Hellenic world of course would then go back to a death accepting 
uh, mentality where it's not much interested in the afterlife, where we've been ever since, and even worse, we, we're moving into a death-denying mentality uh, in the 20th century where we don't even believe in the afterlife or the soul or immortality or anything at all. Uh, we've been bought and sold a line of goods there by a bunch of atheistic materialists who don't know what the fuck they're talking about. What I want to talk about here uh, for a second, though, is since we're on the cosmology of uh, Christianity and the Egyptians, um, and so much of Christianity came out of Egypt, for example, the iconography of um, Isis with Horus, the child Horus on her lap, uh, does become, as a matter of fact, uh, the Byzantine image of Mary with the Christ child on her lap. It's been taken directly from uh, Egypt. A lot of theology has, has been taken, Christian theology has, comes directly out of Egypt. I want to discuss for a second Plots, the cosmology of Plotinus. Spengler has him slotted in his chart on the second phase of the springtime, where he corresponds on the one hand to Hesiod for the Greeks and to Dante for the West as one of the builders, as one of the first systematizers and builders of the new world feeling that was initially expressed through the old epics, the orally told epics, which now begin to be written down by individual writers and a cosmology is formed. Uh, and Plotinus is one of the first to do this for the Magian civilization. His cosmology has the earth at the center of the world, uh, basically the, the, the densest, worst place, uh, the, the realm of generation and corruption, and then it is surrounded by what he calls the anima mundi, uh, which is uh, in motion. Uh, it's incorruptible, but it's in motion, and it moves all the planets. Then out beyond that is the realm of pure mind, nous, N-O-U-S, that is around that, which is uh, incorruptible and motionless. It's not in motion, but it is the realm of the higher mind and where the emanations come from. Uh, and they come from the one. The one is above that. That's another layer above that. So you can see, actually you can see pretty clearly that Plotinus, as an Egyptian philosopher, is essentially mummifying the world. He's, he's taking the Egyptian practice of mummification and he's, wrap, he's treating the world like a mummy. And he's wrapping it in these layers of cosmology. And it's interesting if you think about what the Egyptians did, as they did over time, they kept adding layers around their mummies. Uh, first, you just have the dead body, what's called the cot, K-H-A-T, which corresponds to Plotinus' vision of the earth as a dead thing, the deadest place in the whole universe, corruption and uh, degeneration. And then they wrap a cocoon around that of bandages, which corresponds to the anima mundi, the soul that wraps the first layer that's wrapped around that. Then they put it inside of a rectangular coffin, which then corresponds to noose, and then they put the rectangular coffin inside it of a golden sarcophagus, which then corresponds to the one. So it's, the, it's this idea of layers within layers within layers within layers, uh, and Plotinus does exactly the same thing with his cosmology. Also, I would point out that the one, Nus, and the Anima Mundi correspond to Father, Son, and Holy Ghost in Christian theology. Father corresponding to the one, Son, uh, as the word spoken by the Father, corresponding to the noose, and the Holy Spirit as the anima mundi, that which is winged and in motion. The Holy Spirit is always pictured with wings, doves usually, uh, or angels. This also corresponds to Ray, Atun, uh, Ray, Horus, and Osiris. Ray corresponding to the Father and to the One. Horus corresponding to the Son, the Word, and noose. Osiris corresponding to the Holy Spirit, the anima mundi. <laughs> So that's the sort of cosmology that's going on here uh, with Plotinus. And Plotinus was a man who was very much interested. He, he, his teacher was Ammonius Saccas. As far as we know, left no writings. Um, but Ammonius Saccas knew about Hindu philosophy um, and taught Plotinus quite a bit of it to the point that Plotinus wanted to go to India. His target was to go to India and study there. And he hooked up with a Roman contingent that was supposedly on its way there but the Romans never made it. They got bogged down somewhere in the Middle East, and Plotinus had to turn back. So he never went to India. But it's interesting that he's got a head full of Egyptian theology and wants to go to India because when we compare the Vedantic uh, philosophical system with its idea of layers or sheaths around the Atman, uh, the comparisons are striking. And one begins to wonder about the trade. 
the traffic that was flowing across the old Silk Road that was open uh, from Cadiz, Spain, 100 BC, to Shanghai, China, 100 AD, and the flow of merchants, Buddhist monks, Christian monks that was going back and forth along this road, bringing these ideas, seeding them across these civilizations. The Vedantic idea is this idea that the Atman, the soul, is surrounded, like the, the Egyptian mummy, by layers of sheaths, concentric layers that go around it. The outermost layer is the physical body, the Ana Maya Kosha, Ana, food, Maya, made of, Kosha is the sheath. The Ana Maya Kosha is the sheath made of food. Everything wants to eat everything else. And immediately below that is the Prana Maya Kosha, which is the sheath made of vital forces, all the meridians, and the etheric lines that are used, that are treated in acupuncture and so forth, that corresponds to Rudolf Steiner's etheric body. Uh, Rudolf Steiner does the same thing too. He's got the physical body, and then he's got the etheric body, uh, which is he called, which he says is plant-like. Those plant-like energies that animate uh, the physical body. And then below that is the manamaya kosha, the sheath made of mind, which basically refers to the frontal lobe. And when bad things happen to the Anamaya Kosha, the Manamaya Kosha says all life is sorrowful. Um, desire and fear must be avoided, and Nirvana is the key to avoiding them. Um, so you get those three, and they're all, they're all bound together. Then there's a gap, and then comes the Vigyanamaya Kosha, and the Vigyanamaya Kosha corresponds to the vital forces that bring the grass up, all the instincts. Uh, it's all pre-rational. Um, it's all the instincts in your body that know how to digest your food, the, uh, the sexual reproduction. This corresponds very much to what Spengler will get into later with his conception of Dasein, uh, not Heidegger's Dasein. Spengler's Dasein refers to this very sheath here, the Vigyanamaya Kosha, the sheath of vital forces that uh, runs the world without the intellect having to get in the way. In fact, the intellect as in Zen Buddhism, the intellect can be a liability and get in the way of these vital forces as they just, they know what to do. They just happen. Um, and Spengler will oppose this concept of Dasein to Voxein. Uh, Voxein is waking being, uh, and that will correspond to the realm of waking consciousness and the intellect. Compare that with the Upanishads with the first level of the three layers of consciousness, which is waking consciousness, then dreaming consciousness, deep dreamless sleep, and then Turiya, the fourth, the, the silence, from out of which those three come. Similar to, it's very similar to Spengler's uh, distinction. Spengler sticks with polarities, though. He, he, he likes polarities. Spengler's distinction between Vaxine and Dasein, and then the innermost layers, the Ananda Maya Kosha, the sheath made of bliss, uh, that we try to get access to with drugs and alcohol, opioids, uh, anything that will activate that endorphin stream that's inherently inside of us, um, and it's, just, it's a sheath made of bliss, and uh, if you can't get access to it naturally and normally somehow, uh, you seek artificial substitutes to get access to it, because it is the core of being. Uh, the world is rooted in bliss, the Ananda, Maya Kosha, and then finally is Atman, the self, that all of this is wrapped around. Sounds, again, a little bit like a mummification process, and I would bet money that the Hindus have been influenced by the Egyptians, by Egyptian theology coming across the way, just as uh, Plotinus intended to go to India. I'm sure many others made it there uh, and brought these Egyptian ideas there and uh, had a huge influence on Indian thinking with the Vedantic philosophy. If we think of Rudolf Steiner's version of this, he puts it as uh, what we have in common with the mineralogical world is the physical body. The physical body corresponds to the mineralogical world, whereas the etheric body corresponds to the plant world, the uh, vital forces within us. And then uh, we have that in common with plants. And what we have in common with animals is the astral body. Uh, anything with a nervous system, according to Steiner, has an astral body and correspondingly a voxine, a waking, a sphere of waking being, waking consciousness. Uh, and then what we have that animals don't have is what he calls the ego, and he doesn't mean it in the Freudian sense of the reality function. He means it as a transcendent metaphysical principle that uh, transmigrates from lifetime to lifetime as it puts on these sheaths, disintegrates them on the other side, and puts them off. And this ego is a transcendent unit of consciousness 
that carries your personality along with it. And from what I've learned from my studies of the afterlife on the other side, your personality more or less does remain consistent from lifetime to lifetime with various modifications due to brain architecture and differing brain chemistry and so forth. But you're pretty much the same as, as you go along. Uh, this is what Steiner means by ego. Um, this is the core self. This is the core you-ness of you, of who you are, uh, that goes from lifetime to lifetime. Uh, it can carry some scars, uh, karmic scars, uh, the baggage from previous lives that needs to be worked off. That's the whole point of the karmic process in reincarnation is to work off the samskaras, to work off that baggage, and to evolve. Um, so this is why Rudolf Steiner is my favorite mystic, because I think he hit it closest to the mark. Uh, my researches and studies in the afterlife and the other side uh, have validated things that I read in Steiner years ago and used to laugh at him about, and, and sit back in, in my chair and say, that's... <laughs> It's very clever, very imaginative. There's no way the world works like that. Turns out it does, actually. And that uh, atheists are wrong, people who don't believe in the other side. This whole death-denying culture that Borkenau says that we're in now, in the West, uh, I think is now crumbling and disintegrating, ironically, by, by science itself, because uh, I learned about all this through studying near-death experiences, and the thing is, the technology for reviving people from heart attacks and stuff like that has gotten better and better and better. So we're bringing back more people who have died for a few minutes, five minutes, maybe, whatever the length is. They've gone to the other side and come back. And we're getting more and more people now because the, the technology for reviving people is getting better and better. So we've got thousands of accounts, if you go on YouTube, of people talking about what they experienced in those few minutes when they went on the other side. And they all say the same fucking thing. It's not a bunch of random, hallucinatory, weird uh, accounts that don't correlate. They're all talking about the same country. Now, I've never been to India, uh, but people tell me about India, and, and if enough people tell me enough of the same things about it, then I have to assume India does exist. There's a whole bunch of people are telling me the same stories about what India is like. So I have to assume that it exists. I don't need to go there. Uh, to know that it exists. I know that it does. Uh, the same thing with the afterlife. Um, so Borkenau's cycle here hopefully is coming to an end and we're returning to maybe to a form of, a, of death transcendence. Maybe again, uh, an interest in the afterlife on the other side that science is bringing us that will come through here and dissolve and disintegrate uh, atheism, which I hear is on the decline, by the way. Uh, it, the, the numbers are coming out that atheism is on the decline and religious beliefs are on the rise, um, that's part of the second religiousness of hypermodernity. The second religiousness is bringing all that kind of stuff back. And second religiousness is one of Spangler's main concepts, which we'll, we'll get to here shortly. So that's it for Borkin. I don't want to spend too much more time on his essay. Um, you can get it and read it yourself in his book, End and Beginning. And, and it's chock full of great essays, lots of great insights. Uh, if you've already read Spangler, don't read him if you haven't read Spangler yet. Read Spangler first, because he'll make more sense that way, and you'll see all the kind of addenda uh, that he's adding. Uh, his work is almost like an appendix to Spangler, with all kinds of cool stuff that he adds in. So that's that's Borkenau. We'll leave it there, and then return to the introduction of Decline of the West.